a warm welcome to one and all to the first uh, tra first sessions in the technical track on the day 2 of api days live singapore 2020 good morning good afternoon good evening uh, based on where you are located where you are connecting from we have on uh, we have coming on stage rahul dige from paypal talking to us about simplifying payments and api journey he's a uh, uh, a veteran in the API space with this uh, API and product space with a experience of over 10 plus years and he leads the platform and API products at the PayPal. Rahul, over to you. All right. Thank you, Prashant. Hey, guys. Uh, this is Rahul uh, speaking to you from San Jose, California, where PayPal is based. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about how we at PayPal uh, have been thinking about simplifying payments. Uh, as Prashant mentioned, I've been in the industry for uh, some time, and I can tell you from experience that great API products are not built by accident. Uh, it takes a lot of time, effort, and diligence uh, to get things right. Uh, as some of the next slides will show you, PayPal has at it for a number of years. There are a lot of things we continue to improve, and we will have continue to improve. Uh, what I'm really want to chat to you about today is how you can use some of the learnings that we've had uh, building APIs and use it to your advantage uh, and probably not make the same sort of mistakes that uh, we have made uh, and, and learn from your experience. And that's what I'm uh, going to be my chat about. So having said that, uh, just to set the context a little bit, you know, if, if you were shopping online uh, in mid 90s, you know, cards, credit cards were what people used to shop with. Uh, we then had uh, a whole bunch of mobile wallets uh, come into picture and you know a lot of this probably is on the uh, North American context but typically this has been the evolution of payment acceptance so if you're a merchant you want to accept payments typically start out with offering credit cards then use mobile wallets and if you are truly cross-border uh, you then tend to use local payment methods that are local to the where your buyers are coming from uh, so this has really been uh, the evolution of how different payment methods have come uh, over the last few years. Now, if you look at it from an integration perspective, what you will see is the world really started out with offering SDKs, libraries, and you know you click on a website, it will take you to a whole different page. You type your card, and then you come back, right? And so that's really how it went. Um, you know, sometime around 2005. PayPal launched the wallet and you know, we started offering SOAP-based APIs. So there was sort of a period of time in the world where everything was SOAP and MVP and you know, people just love doing it. Uh, you know, when REST becomes sort of the norm, uh, you know, people started offering REST payment APIs and uh, we started expanding into more and more payment methods. Now, I, I speak to a lot of folks in the financial services industry. Uh, companies have been around for decades, right? And, depending on where your journey started. Uh, you know, if it was PayPal, your journey started with NVP and SOAP. If you are even before that, it was just an SDK library, right? So if you start your company in 2010, you had the luxury of knowing everything in the world at that point, and you could then build your APIs with that worldview in mind. Uh, and the world keeps changing, right? So an API or an API style that's true today, uh, may not be what people or developers expect five years from now. Uh, so we were pretty much in the in the same boat. We've had APIs that were amazing for a time. We've continued to evolve them. And this is really a journey about how we have uh, taken our APIs that we've launched many, many years ago and then continue to keep building upon it. So this sort of gives you uh, hopefully a, a good perspective of you know where PayPal has been we started the journey back in 2004 after we launched the wallet uh, to really enable people to interact with the wallet and accept payments using the wallet. Uh, in 2013, we moved to um, REST. Uh, you know, the whole world had sort of moved on uh, a year or two before us, and it was uh, really us trying to catch up and make sure uh, we get our best foot forward. Uh, in 2018, uh, you know, REST uh, hadn't changed much. We were still offering REST, but, you know, the attitude and wants of developers had changed dramatically. So we thought 
it was a great time for us to rethink what our integration experience is going to look like. And we also embarked on launching our first GraphQL API because we thought that's going to be the way of the future. So we've been constantly um, evolving and the whole goal of this has been, uh, really the goal has been to simplify payments, make it easier for merchants to accept payments and make it easier for them to integrate with us uh, no matter who they are. <clears throat> so you know, at, at every, in every company you sort of come to a point where the company realizes that there is some need for change, right? And uh, companies that are thinking ahead uh, sort of do things proactively, like you know, PayPal is not waiting for GraphQL to be mainstream. We are already out there, uh, but there's always going to be times where you know you you go into a meeting and somebody shows you how great your competitor is, and then it's sort of a rude awakening, and you're like, okay, I really need to go ahead and do this. Uh, there are times when you know you sort of build a product for a particular geography, you're expanding, and all your ideas about how you had built a product actually just uh, get thrown out because you had never built it in uh, internationalization in mind. Uh, you know, companies that have been around for a very long time, it's not going to be surprising at all that the team themselves have forgotten why certain fields and objects were put into the first place. Uh, and actually, there's going to be a, a technology evolution from MVP SOAP to REST to GraphQL and uh, no matter what's next. So there's always going to be a need for change, no matter what. Uh, industry uh, you are in, uh, you know, PayPal operates in, in, in over 100 countries and uh, we get to see different facets. Some countries lag behind others, uh, uh, but the whole idea is that we continue to use the opportunity that we see to continue simplifying the payments. And what I'm going to share with you next is really how do we think about APIs uh, going forward. Now, uh, in terms of um, API thinking, there's been a lot that's been talked in the industry around how do you think about APS first, API as a product, think about developers as your customers. Um, uh, but I'm re I don't feel like I'm going to talk about a lot of these things today. This has been sort of the mainstay of uh, the API industry for the last few years. Uh, there are lots of great resources out there. Uh, what I truly believe is even if you actually do all of this, uh, to the letter T, you might still end up with an API that's just not that great. You know, it, your integration is just not that simple enough. Uh, and what I'm going to hopefully share with you are some of the tips uh, that presumes that you have done all of these things, uh, but really takes it up uh, one more launch. Now, the first message I want to get out to you is really think about who your developers are, right? Like when I first started in the industry, uh, and I asked to do some user research uh, around who our developers are. Uh, the feedback back to me was, well, why don't you go talk with engineers uh, in your group, right? They are developers. Uh, but I think that misses the point because uh, not all developers are the same. Not all developer motivations are the same uh, and nor is their experience. Uh, if you think about it from a PayPal perspective, the people who just put the PayPal button are not typically engineers uh, who are seasoned in payments. They might be a freelancer. They might have just graduated from college. They want to earn quick money on the side. Uh, a, a small business comes to them and say, hey, you know what? Can you help put the PayPal checkout button on the website? And they're going to probably get $200 out of it. So just imagine if you're a developer who's going to get $200 for a project, how much time and effort are you going to really put into it? Uh, consider that as someone who is in the middle who was 35 years seasoned uh, you know technical lead uh, at a large merchant he or she is probably going to need every single field in your api uh, and how are you going to design for someone like her and then on the right you have someone who works for a high tech startup uh, really doesn't like payments at all uh, you know he had to work on the next machine learning algorithm but the startup just feels that it's it's now time to make money and so they've assigned him to work on a payment project. So you have a whole wide range of developers. Now, if you're working for someone which works for a large merchant that's seasoned in payments, you probably have a technical support person helping her. So, you know, how is it really important for you to invest in making your API simple? Whereas if you feel like 90% of your developers are going to be this person on the left who just graduated from college, 
you are going to make a lot of effort to make sure that APIs are as simple as possible, as domain agnostic as possible. So anyone who doesn't even understand payments can actually put uh, a payment method on a PayPal button on and get started. So my encouragement to you is think about who your developers are and your engineering team is really not the right um, uh, focus area. You need to go beyond that uh, and go forward. Now, the other bit uh, that I also want to encourage is not just think about uh, APIs. Uh, APIs are a great starting point, but they are not an end in itself. Uh, if you look about how your APIs are going to get consumed, uh, you know you might think about uh, just reflecting back on the the freelance developer. He or she just wants a PHP or a Python library or a Ruby library to just go and integrate. Right? They just want sample code that they could just plug and play, do minimal amount of work because they're just going to get $200 for it, no matter how much effort they put in. Uh, you might have someone else uh, who might be migrating from your competitor product to you. right? Like If you're based and your sales people tell you that a lot of the business is just going to come from your competitors, um, then you might really have to think about how do you make that uh, simple for them. Uh, someone who's just trying to get payments as quickly as possible uh, wants something that they could just drop in on their website. They just don't want to even touch your APIs. So it's really important to understand how your APIs are going to get consumed. Really think about that end-to-end -end experience. Your APIs are absolutely just a starting point. If you don't think about what that end-to-end -end experience is, what's going through the mind of the developer, what's going through the mind of the people who are going to integrate with you, you're going to end up with just building an API, but not having uh, a support structure at all uh, around it. So keep that in mind. The other thing that we uh, obsess about a lot at PayPal is, is really uh, around naming. Um, you know, there's always someone I meet who just doesn't like their name because their parents named them such that it gets mispronounced or they get teased. and you know, it's it's just one of those things. So what we really encourage folks to do is really think deeply about how do you name certain things. And uh, this is something I went through personally a couple of years ago. Uh, I had twins uh, that were born to us. And as a good product manager, I went to think about, okay, what should I name my kids, right? And to me, I'm, I was born in India. I, I immigrated to US and I'm a citizen now. So I feel like my audience uh, as a good product manager is going to be people from India, uh, people from America who need to say, be able to say my kids say, right? And so a lot of considerations went into making sure that the kids first name, last name rhyme, they're not going to get teased. You know, it's not someone else's name in the family, making sure it's popular and it doesn't have any alternate meanings, right? So uh, parents in the audience can probably relate to it uh, much more because we obsess over naming our kids. Uh, and, you know, we never know till very late whether they like it or not. In my case, I had doubled the problem because I had twins. So I had to make sure that it doesn't happen that one person likes it and the other girl doesn't. Uh, what I really want to encourage you guys is to really think about naming your APIs, naming your fields and objects uh, with the same amount of uh, passion. Uh, you know, the initial APIs for if you just look back, some of the old APIs, they were just fields in a database. Uh, you look at one API provided by the company, uh, it has an identifier called ID, and the other one has it spelled out completely. Uh, you have a mixture of British and American English, which is typically common in companies which span multiple geographies. Uh, we tend to use works that are redundant. Uh, we say things, but it actually doesn't do what it says. Uh, we unnecessarily abridge things. You know, it's we don't live in the world of mainframes anymore. You know, we could spell things out. Uh, and we tend to mix in uh, domain-specific fields uh, when we shouldn't. Like in payments, uh, you have a term called AID, which stands for L and itinerary data. You know, you, you don't really want to call it AID. You know, very few people who know it really understand it. So it's really important to think about what makes sense, uh, be very consistent about it. Uh, but the main point that I'm trying to make is, you know, spend the effort because it, it really does add up in the end. Now, every company has a product development process. Uh, we do have it at PayPal as well. Uh, so I'm just going to work through my slides here a bit. 
uh, which goes through a typical phase of discovery, design, develop, uh, deploy, and launch. Uh, I'm not going to uh, dwell into each one of them. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is uh, the product process or the API design process, it really is up to you to make sure that you follow it diligently. Like if you leave out how your competitors are doing, or if you don't focus on the persona, or if you jump straight to development without focusing on design, uh, if you never go do mocks, if you never test out, uh, you know, you're going to end up with an API that's probably going to be good, right? But it's just not going to be great. Uh, so it's very important for you to follow the process. And I completely agree with you. I work for a large company. It's easier said than done. I've been at the receiving end of things where people ask me, you know, why does it take, uh, you know, a month to add a couple of years? And, you know, sometimes that's the level of investment you have to make uh, if you're building something for the future, right? API is one of those things where you're designing today, but you are really imagining ways in which people are going to integrate with you four or five years down the line. And unless you want to take on a big debt of maintaining multiple versions of your API, you need to put in an investment somewhere. Uh, so it's just one of those things that I would definitely encourage you guys to put in the time and due diligence because just having a process isn't enough. It's actually following it. And as you go through the process and you keep in mind that your goal is to try to simplify something, uh, make it uh, more flexible or make it more consistent, then you'll actually spend the time doing it. The other key bit that I wanted to touch upon uh, is it's important to focus across the ecosystem. Uh, a lot of times people tend to uh, focus on just building the API layer uh, but there's this whole uh, support around it, right? Like making sure that you have a sandbox, making sure uh, that, you know, if a merchant calls in and says, hey, you know, something's not working, that you actually have a way to debug it and not send an email back to the API caller and say, hey, can you tell me the request that you sent in? This is the sort of information you need to have at your end. You don't need to go out and ask someone, you know, what is it that they have sent you. So it's really important that, uh, you think about the ecosystem. This is sort of the ecosystem that we have at PayPal. I think this is very typical of um, in any API program. Uh, it actually is much more complicated than just this. But I think the point being that you really need to focus on uh, the entire ecosystem and not just uh, building the API. Now, having said that, I have been in places where you spend 90% of your effort just trying to get something out of the door. Uh, because you know, if you're starting fresh, if your company has just not done APIs in REST or GraphQL, it's going to be an effort for you. And so sometimes it's just a matter of uh, you know working through it, uh, but don't lose sight of the big picture because that might just come to haunt you. Uh, the other thing I, I do want to uh, say in closing a bit is really think about how you design your organization, uh, because a lot of times what tends to happen is we build, um, this is this is typically how um, companies organize. Sorry, I'm just fiddling with uh, the slides here a bit. Yeah, so just thinking about how the organization is, most companies really have, um, you know, multiple teams working in parallel and they have uh, you know, a governance structure that ties it together, which is, I think, a perfectly great model to federate things out. That's probably the only real way when uh, truly scaled companies can uh, work. Uh, but there is a downside to it, which is if you don't focus on uh, the governance, if you don't have investment into it, over time, little differences do tend to creep out uh, within different a APIs. And a customer that has a need to integrate with more than one of your APIs will start seeing the difference. Um, it's nothing you could do about it. It's just the way sometimes your organization is set up. So if you get the feedback that you know it's it's one of those instances where your APIs are not truly really coherent or not consistent, think about the way your API organization is designed. One of the ways to solve it is you know if there's a certain cohort or a certain segment of merchants that use a, a group of APIs together, you can think of adding uh, or splitting the organization such that just there's just one team that's focused on the API design and 
the interface layer where the rest of the team focus on capabilities. That could be one way to sort of force uh, everyone to converge. Of course, that leads to a bottleneck, uh, but there are ways around it as well. Now, the bigger point that I'm trying to make is think about how your organization is structured, because that, in a lot of instances, do a play a part into how your APIs get designed and built. This is not something people do consciously. Uh, it's just the way organizations are structured, just the way the communication happens. Sometimes it, it sort of morphs into ways that nobody really understands. So I think it's important for you to uh, think about it. Um, <clears throat> to sum it up, uh, my message to you is, you know, think about who your developers truly are. Uh, think about the end-to-end -end experience. Just don't leave it at building an API and forgetting about it. Uh, the end-to-end -end integration is important. Uh, be obsessive about naming because great naming does simplify a lot of things. It simplifies uh, reading through many more documentation that would be otherwise necessary. Uh, focus around uh, the entire API ecosystem. Don't just obsess over building the best API because you would just don't have the best docs or the best sandbox, people are just not going to be happy. And finally, think about how your API organization is structured. Uh, with that, um, you know, that's the end of my talk. I'm always happy to chat. And uh, you know, I think there's some time for Q&A. Uh, so I'm ready to take that um, as well. Thanks, guys. Hi, uh, thanks Rahul for that uh, wonderful insightful session. Um, I haven't yet received any questions to you. Anybody from the audience, do you have any questions? So uh, Rahul, so uh, somebody who wants to um, leverage PayPal um, to build their business, uh, what would be those? top three things that you will uh, advise them to say if i am a um, technology oriented startup and i want to leverage paypal what are those two three things that you will advise them yeah i think um, you know a lot of people come to us to you know either accept payments or optimize on the payments that they already have so my advice uh, to them is uh, sort of really invest in the, uh, you know, definitely choosing PayPal is, I would say, the right step for them. I'm, I'm a very loyal PayPal employee, but I think the important thing to them, just from a pure payments perspective, is uh, pick the right provider based on what your needs are, right? And and focus on optimizing the experience for your buyer, uh, and definitely focus on optimizing the experience when things go wrong, right? Um, there is always a need to do it. Uh, focus on where your buyers are from. A lot of people just start accepting cards and never move on to anything else. Cool. Uh, if your buyers are coming from somewhere else, think about ways what you can offer them. So these are two or three things I can I can talk. There's, there's many more things, but uh, these are things that come to mind. Right. Great. Uh, thanks, Rahul. Thanks for joining All us. Right, then. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.